Hi, everybody. This is a wee bit of alchemy. I'm Rick Barrett. Welcome. Uh, last week, I talked a bit about hard focus and soft focus, soft eyes. And, you know, by that we mean the ability to shift one's focal plane so that we are um, uh, it, the visual information is undifferentiated. So this contrasts with a hard focus, which is where you're looking at a point and you're, you're like say you're reading a book and you're, you're looking that you're focusing on the, the words, you're focusing on the images on the page. And with that comes an intellectual process. There's a, it's, the, the, the two seem very tied together, your, the hard focus and the, the intellect, the ability to differentiate. You know, so when we're reading, we're saying, this is not that. We're constantly putting things together in ways that contrast and compare, which is great because that's how we communicate and how we translate, how we pass along information. But there's also this whole other setting, which is a soft focus, which is actually precedes all that intellect. It, it's what happens prior to thinking about it. It's where we just receive the information in an undifferentiated way. And this is something that's very useful in a lot of things, but particularly in the martial arts. There's a lot of names for it, you know, soft eyes is one thing. Um, the uh, see the distant mountain is a, a colorful way of, of putting it. Another uh, one is, you know, the thousand yard stare, you know, there's a, the sense is that you are gazing off into the distance and you've reduced your visual plane to a flat plane. So it's very much like um, a wide angle lens on a camera. So the, the more you do that, you, uh, you get rid of depth of field. That is, you're, you're not able to see you know, the apparent distance that uh, you can whenever you're on a hard focus. And that's more like a, a telephoto lens where you know, in soft focus, you're just looking at the forest and in hard focus, you're maybe looking at an apple on a tree. And uh, so you're collapsing your your field of vision, narrowing it down so that you can get detail on a specific object. So you create, it allows you to shift into that object-based consciousness, which is great for thinking, it's great for comparing, it's great for any kind of intellectual endeavor. But whenever we shift into the soft focus, we're basically allowing the whole field to come in and this is useful to martial artists because in doing so, you're able to pick up, you're able to sense with uh, beyond, you're able to see without your eyes, basically. It's a, you know, that's the way they talk about it. It's like you're able to, to shift into seeing with three eyes. You're able to go into a super conscious state and perceive in ways that are, not limited by that that tight visual um, uh, uh, narrow focus. So being able to shift back and forth between those has the effect, first of all, of unsticking your attention. And but it also allows you to shift easily into different states of awareness. So you go from a hard focus, which is a very uh, object-based consciousness to soft focus, which becomes a, a, a non-objective awareness or an undifferentiated awareness. And then which if you can shift back and forth easily between the two, it comes in real handy. And so your, your capacity to do that enhances your Kung Fu. So a lot of what happens with a lot of us is, uh, you know, if we're, say at a job where you're looking at a computer screen all day, you know, you're reading things off the computer screen, that's a fixed distance. And that's all hard focus stuff. If you're reading or writing, you know, I find that when I'm writing for hours, you know, I'll be like, you know, 
uh, I'm kind of stuck in, in, in that, that way of being. And that, what that does, it reinforces the neural connections that are associated with that hard focus, which then makes it kind of the default setting. So you see people who, after spending all day working on a computer, they spend their evenings watching TV. And it's the same kind of thing. It's still like you're, you're looking at these images. And um, so being able to consciously shift allows you to break out of that. It, you get out of a, a fixed trance-like state where you're you're locked into this uh, this narrow way of, of of seeing things. So I came up with a little exercise writing about this week, and uh, like to, to to do it with you if you if you don't mind. And uh, I find this uh, kind of helpful, and it allow it, it provides a framework that you can expand to other things. So just uh, you can do it standing or sitting. And the basic idea is you're going to pick up, reach out with your index with your index finger, if that your hand doesn't matter which hand, and you focus on your finger. So this is a hard focus. You're, you're, you've got one point of of attention, and do that for like three breaths. You can do it for more if you like, but the you know, for this exercise, we want to just do it for like three breaths. So you're keeping your attention on your finger. Good. Now, without moving your eyes or not moving them much, you want to bring in, you want to look beyond your finger and just take in the whole room that you're sitting in. So your eyes will adjust so that your everything goes into a flat plane. And if you see your finger at all, you may notice that there's two of them now. That's because as you your eyes are no longer integrating and trying to uh, create one image, but they're just sort of taking it all in. Now bring it back to the finger. So when we do this, there's something called a saccade, which is your eyes flit back and forth very fast to create a fixed image. You got these two different camera lenses that are, that are focusing on that. And by flitting back and forth, it creates depth of field. So everything else just sort of fades into the background and all that matters is that finger. So now we shift back to the far look. You're reaching out and focusing the soft focus and allow it to just fill up. Going into a flat plane and you're just allowing more information to come in. Now bring it back to your finger and hold that for one breath. Now shift to soft focus for one breath. And back to your finger for one breath. Back to soft focus for one breath. Now just hold that soft focus for five breaths. And just notice the effect that's having on your state of awareness.
Now bring it back to your finger for five breaths. Now put your hand down and consciously without having your finger there, just constantly shift back and forth for, hold it for a breath, shift to soft focus. Shift to hard focus, pick out one point. And soft focus. Hard focus. Good. Okay. So, um, how'd that go? It was. It was very interesting. The uh, I I noticed a. Um, slight subtle but very interesting difference in in how i felt both awareness and presence um in soft focus i felt you know a sort of more of a uh oneness of my my panoramic visual awareness of the room and my sense of embodied presence was more like one one big smushy thing um, and then when I was focused, hard focused on the finger, um, I wasn't, uh, I didn't have the same sort of sense of embodied awareness, but the finger had more chi, my hand had more chi in it. My finger and my hand sort of got energized. It was as though there was a correspondence between embodied presence and aliveness and the focus. Beautiful, beautiful, well put. Excellent description. Thank you. Anybody else? Richard. Uh, it seemed to take more uh, effort or energy to focus than to not focus. That seemed so to be work, right? working a which little harder. The, which one took more energy, the soft focus or the hard? The hard focus. Took more energy. It seemed like I was work that I was working the hard focus. Good. Good. And, and, you know, you're actually, your eyes are working harder. There is muscular contraction around your eyes for the hard focus. So we get eye strain if we're like, you know, we're reading for a long time because there's the, that saccade is, is, you know, the eyes are flitting back and forth. There's muscular tension in the eyes to, that, that happens. So whenever we uh, take a little break and Go to soft eyes, it changes. It, it gives your, your body a chance to rest a little bit, shift your, shift your state of awareness, and, but also physically get a chance to rest. Now, I spend a lot of time on the computer, of course, um, and Sharon's always trying to make sure that I remember to get up, get up and look to the horizon. Beautiful, beautiful. I'm not. And, I'm not good at doing it, but she keeps trying. <laughs> well, it's it's something that I think is is a very healthy thing, and it allows for more whole brain coherence. So instead of just working over this one, you know, like say working over your bicep muscle over and over again, you know, it gives you a whole body workout, you know, a whole brain workout allows you to, to access parts of your nervous system, which are um, perhaps underutilized. Um, do you have, this just, it's, it's a little bit of an aside, but it just occurred to me that maybe we could talk about a good five minute break for those of us who tend to be uh, focused on our desk. A lot of the time, sure. yeah. Things, things to do, things to take five minutes to do to sort of rescue yourself. Yeah, and, guess, and this focus issue is definitely one of them. Uh, 
Sure. You know, Sharon's idea is great. You know, go out there, you know, at um, one uh, thing that I, uh, for city dwellers, you go out, take a walk and look at the tops of buildings. You know, it's something you never do until you do. You know, it's like, oh, wow. I, I, I never noticed that architecture. I mean, New York City, it's great because there's all kinds of fancy stuff at the, at the, at the roof line. You know, and uh, oh, you know, I would have missed all that, you know, but uh, you get a chance to do that, you know, for those who are a little more out in the in the sticks, you know, it's uh, like, you know, out here in Staten Island, you know, I go to the park, you know, take a walk around the park and like, you know, it's, uh, uh, you get a chance to, to, uh, to <coughs> vary your, your, your visual planes. <coughs> And so you get a chance to to open up that way, um, but things like that, you know, the um, uh, anything that can kind of unstick you, because if you just keep going in one direction, you're gonna, you know, that that part's gonna get tired and overdeveloped. So you want to keep moving around, Sharon. Well. Um... With the exercise we just did, when we were in the soft gaze, my eyes get so, my eyelids get so heavy that I really just want to, it's like I'm struggling to keep them open. Right. As they want to shut. Right. And that's, that's actually uh, something they, they talk about being half lidded and think, you know, I think also like in, in uh, uh, some forms of meditation, I think in Zen that they, it's like half lidded, you know, so you have that there's in that type of meditation, which allows for a soft focus. But, but you're right, it, it, there's a tendency to go all the way and say, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> and uh, because we only have that, those two settings for a lot of us, you know, it's either, you know, know. Wide, wide open and go, 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 or else going to sleep. <laughs> and uh, to be able to, they just very gently allow the world to come to you to receive information rather than reaching out and grabbing it, you know, is uh, it's a whole different way of being. So the soft focus actually allows us to notice more things in our environment. Yeah, it's actually, they've done psychological studies on it and you actually, you know, they, you pick up more information it also does a thing with uh, your time sense. Your, it, it allows, it expands your time sense so that you're able to notice more things in, in, in a fixed amount of time. And this is something that um, they've done, you know, experiments on. It's like, like probably like twice as much in a, uh, you know, with, with the soft focus. You know, if that's part of the training for, um, like police officers, prison guards, or FBI agents. Or... I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure it is. I was just writing about that. It's like you know, you know, a FBI agent. You know, uh, particularly like say looking at, at over a crowd. You know, is is in soft focus until it's like, oh, there's a gun over there, and then boom. You know, then you go to hard focus, and then you you notice. You say, okay, that's you know the guy in the and the, the, the black trench coat has got a got a Glock, you know, and then you, you know, you the, then the the intellect starts kicking in. But until that time is just like you're kind of wide open to anything that might be happening there. So you're you're actually able to be more aware of your environment by trying not to pay attention to everything in your environment. Precisely, because if you close down. If you close down your attention, then you're, you know, like, like Blake said, you know, you're see through the narrow chinks in your cavern, right? right. And that's, you know, that's, uh, so we want to, uh, if, you, you know, if the doors of perception are cleansed, we see the world as it is, infinite. And that's kind of what he's talking about there. The, in that soft focus, the, it's undifferentiated. So therefore, anything's possible. And it also allows you to, access different parts of your, your brain that 
bring up cool stuff that your conscious mind can't, uh, you know, doesn't have any clue about. Peter, you had something. Yeah, uh, two things. One, I, I wanted to share, Richard, uh, uh, something I've been experimenting with for, for sort of disengaging short breaks, actually less than five minutes. And for me, it's like, uh, in between each activity, I do a sort of very relaxed uh, breath awareness meditation for three breaths, just three relaxed breaths. In between, you know, you do something before you go on to the next thing, three relaxed breaths. And I find it, it's very interesting. I recommend the experiment. And the other thing is that the, what you were just saying, Rick, reminded me, I've been thinking about it since we, we did the uh, switching back and forth soft and hard focus, uh, a theme I've been interested in for a long time in spirituality and spiritual life is balancing and harmonizing what I think of as the two, the two um, sides, um, open receptive and active creative, you know, and various voices and traditions tend to emphasize one, it's like a dominant recessive gene uh, for example, Buddhism is more open receptive. Judaism is more active creative, but they all have both. And, and I think I noticed in going from hard focus to soft focus, it seemed to strike the note of, you know, the, the um, open receptive, I seem to, I mean, soft focus, wide lens seemed to bring me back to open receptive mode. And the you see what I'm saying, right? Absolutely. Because what, what are we doing there? I mean, active, creative is young. You know, it's going out. You know, the open receptive is yin. So what we're doing here is is playing with yin and yang, and to be able to to be able to control both is uh, is important for your kung fu. And uh, those. People who cannot do that, you know, going, you know, like say people who are, who are, their attention is easily fixed, are easily transable. You know, you can, you, you know, that's where, you know, hey, look over here, you know, pow, you know, there's a, uh, um, it's, they're easy, you, you can pull their attention really quickly. Whereas someone who's soft focused is like, huh, okay, no threat there. All right, you know, and, and you're able to to attune to whatever is developing. So you know the uh, you know the the sword saint of Japan Miyamoto Musashi, you know, talked about this, like you know how you you want to open it up so you're not seeing it with your eyes. You know, that's how he was able to he's able to go in and and you know. Fight a hundred, a hundred swordsmen and and emerge victorious. You know, it was like his his thing. You know, and uh, he said, "Yeah, you just you're you're." He's able to shift into that that heightened state of awareness because it's it's not locked into any one specific thing. You always that's you always see that moment in movies when the hero is facing off against ten or fifty people. They get still, and it's wide focus, right? Beautiful. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay, so uh, uh, moving on. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about is uh, something we've been talking a lot about lately. But I, uh, I guess I was working with the guys on Saturday at, in, in the class on Saturday, and and. I, as much as I've talked about it, I, I, I think it needs um, needs even deeper, and that's about Sun Kwa and how to get there, and really learning how to control your Kwa. Um, it runs so counter to our experience, so counter to everything we've done in our lives, and. For most of us here, it's it's you know that's that's a long time, and it it requires a lot of conscious attention in order to to put in this new program. 
And um, the observation, because you know, even people have been talking about this for years, see, they, there's still a tendency to cling to muscular tension in the hips, which um, causes, if, if you're tensing up the substantial leg, even the insubstantial leg also tends to get, get tense, which then means that you're not able to, first of all, allow the chi to move through, but second of all, being able to be supple enough to be able to, to release the tension in your upper body so that you can, you can do this smoothly. And an observation I made is that the tendency to hold that, that say your, your right leg is substantial, your insubstantial qua is, uh, the re reason that gets held tight is because the, uh, we don't really trust the, the substantial leg. And whenever that releases, whenever, so that, whenever we feel that substantiality there and we trust it, then we can then let go of the, of the other hip and then it permits freedom of movement. And it's one of those things that you're, you can get in the abstract, but whenever it comes down to actually doing it, it becomes a little more challenging. And the, the thing that I think happens with most people is that they try to do the, it all at once. That is modify the structure. So let me stand up and show you what I'm talking about here. So if I'm standing with my feet, my weight's 50, 50, and I want to, I want to go into my right leg and make that my substantial leg so that I can, I can pick up my left one. If I try to get some qua while also shifting, then it becomes very difficult for me to pick up that leg. It's because the, I'm, the, my hips are still in the, in the process of, of protecting me from falling over. So it's a sequential thing. In order to be able to do that, you have to be able to, first of all, establish the foundation. And only whenever that becomes really, really solid, really, you're feeling the support of that, can you then pick up your, your other leg because you're able to then support it. So it's a, it's a thing. So first you establish your, your, your base, then you release, and then it allows you to, to free up the other leg. So the, the hack, the, the technique for training this, is I, I'm sure I've mentioned something like this before, but I want to really emphasize it now because this is something that is it's easy to kind of glide over until you actually have this. It's going to be tough. And the way you know if you can you have it or not is you go up on one leg and you have someone push on your arm and see if you're rooted. You know if you're you can be balanced on one foot without being rooted. So to be able to be rooted means that you can take a substantial amount of incoming force without losing your center, without losing your, your energetic connection to the earth. I remember seeing uh, Master Yu down in Chinatown years and years ago, but he, he went into a, a, a golden rooster posture and he held that for, it must have been like five minutes. Meanwhile, being charged at by half a dozen different people and he would just toss them aside. And, but he, he just stood there on one leg and you know, it, was, it, was, it was no big deal for him. So this is something that, you know, that's a, that's a very high level to be able to do it, sustain it for that length of time. But being able to consciously trust your substantial leg then frees you up to do all kinds of cool stuff. So the, the drill here 
would be to, to you, you get support. If you have a table or a chair or anything like that, you want to get it. So let's, let's say I'm gonna go to my left leg here and I want to be able to pick up my right leg to, uh, as I'm standing right now, that's impossible. I need to build a foundation in my left leg in order to do that. So I'm gonna feel the ball of my left foot, set my left knee, and push away from the earth. So I'm just kind of getting a yang impulse to push away and then uh, release down into that leg. So by doing that, by releasing down, I've created a, an, a softening in my qua, which then allows me to pick up the leg because this leg is now very, very loose. If I don't do that, if I just try to pick up my leg, I can't because this, this is getting tight. So uh, grab something that, you know, a couch, a chair, table, whatever. And let's, uh, let's, let's play around with this a little bit. Because breaking it down like this is, is super important, particularly for those of us, you know, we're, uh, we want to, to be, have stronger legs and a better, better uh, root as we go forward. So being able to break this down and, and, and get that. And you don't have to do anything extreme here. In fact, less is more. So you want to feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, and the hand on the chair is just, it's just there for psychological reassurance. So you push away from the earth with your left leg. So notice that as you're doing that, you're taking the load off the right leg. Like just pushing away, you're pushing away from the earth and then uh, settle down into it. And then just pick up the heel of your right foot. And just hold that for a moment. Just feel into that. And put your heel down and push away and return back to 50 50. Maybe turn the left foot out a little bit so you get that, that go up there. So feel the ball, set the knee and uh, push away and then release down. So just that pushing away gives you a yang to which you can then compare the yin of the releasing. This is not something that you're going to do forever. It's just something that helps for now. Pick up your heel and feel a nice relaxed leg there. And just feel the, the weight of your body pressing down into, into your leg. Feel that it's doing work. You're actually exercising here by holding your posture with one on that on the left leg right now being substantial. So the um, it just by doing that by allowing yourself to settle in, get that yin support. There is a workout there which is really important, and it's it's a different kind of workout than if you're just you know doing squats or something. This is a different kind of workout. This is a, a yin support kind of thing. So then put your heel down hmm, and return to 50-50. Turn your right foot up on a 45, set the ball, set the knee, push away and uh, settle in, releasing that left leg but trusting your, your right leg as you're doing this. Pick up the heel, slide that foot forward, slide it back. Just get that feeling. So you're noticing you're, I'm not adjusting my, my posture to 
<laughs> to accommodate this. It just, the leg gets to move freely because the hip is, has been freed up. And put the foot down and go back to center. Do the ball, the right foot, set the right knee and push away with the right leg. So you're consciously loading up that right leg and ah, settling down, settling down, emptying out the right leg or the left leg, I'm sorry, left the left leg so that it's nice and free. As you're doing this, shift into a soft focus. Just allow yourself to fill your visual field with everything in the room. And notice what effect that has by doing that. Put the heel down and go back to center. Turn your left foot out, feel the ball of the left foot. Set the left knee, push away and release that right leg, pick up the heel. And this time just step forward, place your heel down in front. Slide the foot back. And your right foot out. Ball the push away and sink. Pick up the left heel, step out, put the heel, the heel down, empty step. Just feeling into that. No, he's saying that. Just feel the support of that of your right leg now. It's the substantial leg. Feel that soft focus. Pick up the foot, step back. Just notice that as you do this, you start to get more and more confident in your ability to, to do that, to hold that. You can grab onto the chair now and feel the ball of the right foot, set the right knee, push away, sink and release down. This time pick up the heel and pick up the knee. You're holding onto that chair, which gives you that support that your body, this is the psychological tool that I'm, 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 I'm talking about here. Since you're not afraid of falling over, you can then just allow yourself to, to do the exercise and place the foot down. Feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, push away, good. And then release, sink down. Find your center equilibrium. Pick up the right heel, step forward, place the heel down. Step back, pick up the knee, step down. So the emphasis I'm, I'm making here is this guy here is your buddy. It permits you to do things that you can't do on your, on your own, or if you try to do them without the support, you're still going to be fudging it. You're still going to be doing things to, you know, to compensate for the fact that you're afraid of falling over. This enables you to, uh, to create a sense of safety there. So uh, why don't you uh, grab a seat, see if there's any questions on this.
How'd that go? Good. So, Rick, Rick, I just, I, I haven't said anything about it, but um, both of my knees seem to be past their warranty date. Um, oh dear. So I've, I've been having a lot of trouble. Um, and, uh, you know, go, I'm, I'm addressing it as best I can, but uh, I suspect that, uh, well, I'm, I'm going to keep working on it, but that's why I'm not participating. But it, okay. Okay. Yes. is it a bone on bone situation? Uh, well, one, one, the knee that's the knee that's not in pain has no cartilage. The other knee, uh, which does have some cartilage, has it flared up a few weeks ago, and I'm mm. having trouble getting it under control. So, okay, I just wanted I just wanted to mention it because I know it's when I'm not participating, it's conspicuous. So, I'm uh, I'm <laughs> absorbing I'm absorbing as much as I can. Uh, great, good, Rick, you had some. I mean, I, I think I mentioned uh, to you before that uh, every morning I do about half hour, 45 minutes of a combination of all my teachers, uh, you, Steve, uh, Don, Ethan, and my Taiwanese, Bong Sayuk. And it's interesting, just before I do the clearing and disappearing of the chi, I do an exercise very similar to this, which I've gathered from you. So I haven't used, I haven't needed or used the chair for quite some time. So it was fun to do that here tonight to see whether it worked under pressure or under view as it were. Yeah. I mean, once, once you established again, I've been very lucky in that once you've taught me something, I know it's possible. So I no longer have a fear of falling or any, or anything else. So yeah, I can, uh, tell anybody who cares to hear that, you know, just open your mind, have faith in yourself, do it. And Beautiful. yeah, it's fun. It's fun. And it, it's something that I know for me, I'm better able to do this stuff than ever, you know, and it's because I'm breaking it down the way I'm, I'm telling you is, you know, I, yeah, I used to be able to compensate because you know I had more more muscle and 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 you know it, it, it younger knees and things like that, and I was able to I was able to fake it, but it you know I have more root now in my in my stance than I ever have, and uh, I, it's something that I think is possible for 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 most of us if you dial it back and do it real simple rather than going oh i can do level five you know yeah <laughs> yeah no 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 do level one just yeah. do level one and uh keep uh, keep doing that for a while or as i say no pain you're doing it right <laughs> and also Peter. oh good okay, go. I, I, yeah just just to finish up as a person who's about to turn 69 I'm, I also don't have much concern about, I don't have that much to lose anymore. So I don't have to, you know, I don't have to make, oh, gee, what if it doesn't work? Oh, I don't care. Let's try it. <laughs> Beautiful. Good. Good. Peter. You're, you're on mute, Peter. Been working on some qua in the midst of cloud hands, trying to do the spiraling down during cloud hands. And I, I wanted to ask you about a specific thing. I, I've been doing the, the circular hand pattern. So the hands are moving in circles, that version of cloud hands. Oh, right. And, and coordinating it and noticing that, you, you know, sort of breaking it down. So like first shift the weight, turn the body, those two big pieces of cloud hands, turn the, shift the weight. And as I shift the weight, the hand, um, I'm coming to center and the hand is at the top. And then as I spiral down, say to my right, the hand goes down. So there's a coordination, uh, you know, and then you come back to center is kind of uh, your, and then it's like, I, uh, shifting the weight passes through center, you know, which is kind of up, 
the opposite of spiraling down, center takes you up a little bit and the other hand is up. So the hands seem to be naturally in cloud hands to be coordinated in the circle pattern with spiral down and then back up to center. And the, the, the point of this is, and I picked this up somewhere, I'm wondering about the, um, the benefit for finding Sun Kwa of, of connecting the energy of the hand movement with the, the energy in the, in the hips. Absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the things that we talked about months ago was the idea of reaching with the elbows and coordinating that with the, with the qua. So as you sink into the qua, you get sun qua, you reach with the elbows to open up really the shoulder qua, you know, the, the shoulder joint. Uh, so you coordinate that. And so then it allows this, this flow of energy, which is unimpeded by muscular tension when you do that. So getting it, so let me talk, let me show you what I'm talking about here. If, uh, so let's say, um, all right, let's, let's say I'm doing a, an exercise where I'm going to, I'm going to be doing like this, right? So I feel the ball set the knee. I kind of feel that push away and then sink in. And, and as I do that, I reach with my elbows and reach with my hand. So there's a continuum, an energetic continuum that goes to actually both hands. And I turn, boom, like that. So there's there's no break in the gin there. Then I feel the ball of the left foot, set the left knee, push away and then spiral down. And as I do that, then reach with the elbows and hand comes across and then turn. But you can see as you do this, you're linking up the energy that's coming up from the earth through your torso and you're expressing it through the arms and by, by creating a coordination of those two so that you're, it's uh, the, the elbows are linked with that Sun Kwa, then everything, uh, the power is magnified in everything you do at that point. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful, Rick. Thank you. You know, I'm reminded, uh, you know, the, my favorite book, not counting yours, which are the favorite, but one of the first books on Qigong, <laughs> one of the favorite books I read, first read, is, Qi, is by Wayson Lau, this little paperback, Qi, Discovering Your Life Energy. And in the back, he has some really nice, simple practices. And one of them, the last one, is the trickiest, it's, or one of the last, he call, it's compressed Tai Chi ball. You, you, have, you create a Tai Chi ball, and then you shift the weight to one side, you turn to that side, the ball is now like horizontal, and you sink your weight down onto that leg, you compress, you go down, you compress the ball, and then it pops out, and it soars across. Uh, and then, and then you, you compress it, and then you soar across and shift the weight. And there's a similar thing to what you were just demonstrating, nice. which one of his fundamental basic practices. I think there's a principle, you know, the principle you explained is running through all of this. It's the, you know, getting the, the gin flowing, the chi flowing through your arms and upper body coordinated with the, you know, just what you said, I don't have to repeat it, but it's well, really- you're, you're unkinking the hose. So it's you know the, the the nine channeled pearl, you know they talk about you know where if you're the nine channeled pearl it means that the the chi is running through all the joints, in an unbroken way, so you've unkinked the hose and you're allowing for this energy 
to be able to move around and there's no break in the in the continuum your body is you know everything is feeding everything else it's just you know i'm just always getting taken aback at um how we are in working with you discovering principles that we should have been learning to discover as we began our practice um but I mean, there's no, I don't, reg I don't, reg I don't regret it, but it's just, <laughs> but it's just sort of, I, I keep getting insights into why is it that masters achieve the gifts that they seem to have achieved? And it's not something that started toward the end of their lives. It's something that was embedded in the beginning of their lives. Um, but uh, I, I don't know about that. I think we, we get the information when we can have it. You know, well, that's there's always that. <laughs> yeah, I, I I share all kinds of things, you know, with people, and you know, I may have said it like a thousand times, and suddenly, like they'll say, "Wow, why didn't you ever say that before?" <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I always say, "Oh, now <laughs> okay, I get it. oh, now I get it." <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like, gee, you never said that before. It's like, yeah, I kind of did. <laughs> yeah, but but creating power through substantiality rather than strength is so profound. Uh, yeah, and learning to control attention. You know, the thing we're doing with the hard and soft focus is controlling attention. You're controlling your mind. You're controlling your nervous system. You're regulating it all so that you can get out of your own way, because there's lots of hidden booby traps that that your dna has provided you with that uh, that are carryovers from earlier <laughs> you know uh earlier models and uh so that uh you know you you have to kind of sort through them and say okay which one of these actually do i need right now you know and there's uh you know that that's that's what we're doing. So I think uh, going back to your your earlier point, there is like the reason why kung fu is you know a diligent effort over time is the fact that it takes time to be able to improve your nervous system enough to be able to absorb the lessons that you're getting. So whatever whatever you're getting is great, you know, and it's like. You move on, you do the next one and the next one, and oh boy, oh boy, you know, there's never, it's, it's a, uh, you know, there's never an end to this particular game. You, there's a constant opportunity for, to discover. Cool. Okay. Thank you all so much. This has been great. Love you no, all. We, we, have, we have another class next week. Yes. Next Tuesday. Yes. Okay. Well, I want to see the award when we start. <laughs> okay. I want you to hold it up right in front okay. of you. We'll do All it. right. See okay. you then. Have a great, have a great Thank ceremony. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Travels. See you next Safe travels. <laughs>